Today on RVA Grooves, I get a chance to chat with two of the key visionaries behind TEDx RVA. I then head to Sugar Shack where I experience the new RVA donut craze. And I end the day with a fabulous dinner at Roosevelt and talk with the publishers of Grid Magazine. RVA Grooves starts now. stage content and that was the 28 or so speakers 14 or so from Richmond in the region 20, 14 from domestic and even international and then there was the off the off the right. stage experiences that were just kind of fascinating but on the stage just before I allow Lisa to kind of go off the stage stuff on the stage we had an amazing group of people um, a few of them to highlight would be Kevin Carroll former Nike catalyst and who talked all, all about the idea of play which was warm to my heart um, we had Zoe Romano a Richmonder who has just finished running the entire route of the Tour de France in um, spirit running of it. running it running it, <laughs> running it not biking it running it in the spirit of raising money for world pediatric uh, project through the platform of plan G who was also a part of the um, project and Marty Bell um, we had Mike Henry, who was just this amazing international phenomenon creative who lives right here in the West End of Richmond, who is the voice and the producer and the writer of Family Guy. And so we had this amazing eclectic group of people complemented by Elo, this amazing pianist that's Juilliard trained, grew up in Brooklyn and New Jersey, and then we find him on the stage playing this beautiful, kind of not even classic piano, but rock jazz piano, and just lit the lit the uh, web up in terms of his energy and his excitement. Yeah, I mean, we thought it was really important and, and people who were involved in the team, and we had a great team. It wasn't just by no. any stretch of the imagination, Andy Not and I. There close. were a huge team of people who worked on this. And I think that we all thought it was important if our thing was create, that it's not just about what you see on the stage. And many TEDx events, I, I think, are often like that. You listen to people talk and you're inspired by what they're saying to you and how they're demonstrating their, their, their life to you. But we thought it was important to have a creative aspect that was happening throughout the day. And this was really the vision of our creative experience team. So that the individuals who are sitting in the audience then can also sort of watching the space in the power plant be transformed throughout the day. So every time there's a break and they, they get up and they walk out, the space looks a little different to them. We had a sculpture going on. Uh, we, we had a radio booth going on where people could be interviewed and, and we were sort of compiling and documenting what some of the speakers were saying and their impressions of the day. Um, we had a charity, yeah, the charity water event that day where people actually took these large, and I, of course I, I'm going to forget how many gallons, but these the big sort of jugs that, that people often have to, to use in, uh, in other countries to get water every day. And we, it was about a mile and yeah, a half we had, we walk, a, a whole yeah. group of people who took was, these heavy cans of water. And it was beautiful. It was 7 a.m. before the entire yeah. event even started to take shape at the, over at the power plant. Of course, Lisa and her old team was here, you know, all night long the night before, I'm sure. But 30 uh, odd some odd people grabbed these jerry cans, these amazingly right. beautiful, beautiful yellow cans, and carried them in the spirit of about a mile up and around this area of downtown so they could experience what it was like. And they dropped them off inside the power plant. We had a nice moment of really reflecting how important we should think about where people create and how people create around the world to actually survive. Um, and it, ironically enough, and, and kind of in a neat and serendipitous moment, it was 
International Water Day that day. So we had a simulcast in from the executive director of, of Charity Water from New York. Actually, he was somewhere else in the world giving a big event, but he simulcasted in to talk to us about that as well. I think, think what we really were looking for that day is on the stage, off the stage, but also how the experience touch points of the user were kind of diverse and varied all the way, well, all the way through the day. So it's what you saw, what you felt, what you experienced, what you ate, how you interacted. I mean, we actually made people work for it. It wasn't this perfectly refined setting where it was right. perfect climate control and perfect everything. We yeah. knew we had challenges, but we knew that create doesn't always happen elegantly and easily. Create happens with friction and tension and interestingness. So we had people wearing headphones during the day when they wanted to have a different experience, more of an actual, like you're inside the speaker while they're on the stage when they're inside the headphones. Right. And then they could take them off and have a more of an acoustic experience. We and, had and actually, actually the creation of the, the theater itself was a creation. Yeah. I mean, it, we thought that was important. Don't we looked that. at we looked at lots of different venues that are beautiful that would have had everything ready to go. Powers there, sounds there, lights there, you know, carpeting, uh, acoustic equipment, uh, as well as seats. I like, I like <laughs> and the joke that Lisa put the first power outlet in that building and broke down a wall in order to have more people be accommodated with fire marshal. We literally laws. knocked a hole in the wall so that we could, we could, you know, have more people in there according to the, the fire marshal's uh, regulation. So the actual space itself was a creation. So from, from the get-go, from everything, we, Everything we did was literally creating the event that day. Yeah. TED, T-E-D, stands yes. for? It stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. And TED as a brand, as in his idea, was originated about 30 years ago in a gym in Palo Alto. And it was a visionary guy who said, I want to bring get together people to talk about what he felt were the really true, really three big issues in terms of the future of the world, technology, entertainment, and design and um, it has stood the test of time. It really does. If you look at those big, big, big three themes, if you kind of look around, we are a design world, we're an entertained world, we're a technologically connected world. And so um, they've stood the test of time and so it just keeps on going. And Lisa, we're all about art and culture and the creative boom is just exploding in Richmond. Amy's already said it's coming back the second year. Yes. How do people get involved? Do you need help? Like, tell everybody how to, to, to experience we want, every, we want everybody involved and everybody's help. We're just yes. trying to figure it out, but it's we, exciting. We, we had our first meeting recently for uh, 2014, so we're just sort of getting started and start, starting to think about how this year will be different, how it will be similar. Uh, but, yeah, we're going to we're gonna have the word out pretty soon about how people can get involved. I think two of, the, two of the main themes would be, one is that TEDxRVA is a website go to. There's a place where you can kind of right. just register on and we'll find a slot of way and involvement in, in any level we can in terms of getting people involved. I think that's part of this idea is to have as many people from different backgrounds and different interests and passions involved to create the next version of what we theme um, to be determined for round two. The other part of, of kind of involving people is we actually may and we're thinking about some gathering of people to actually come and kind of involve themselves in the formulation and the maturation of round two so that people can kind of come together before we have it all organized and say what is it you'd like to work on and what might you be able to bring in terms of set of skills and passions and connectivity and so bring the community together to kind of say round two is happening how might you like to be involved and really kind of just open up the dialogue and see where that might go. Well, Andy and Lisa, thank you guys both for taking the time to talk thank to our you. Thank you. The Create Movement, we got to keep it going. <laughs> we so we are. That everybody in Richmond gets involved and we bring people from other parts of the region down as well to experience TEDx RVA. Thank you guys once again. Thank Absolutely. you, Kelly. Hi, I'm Mike Henry. I'm from the RVA and I play Cleveland on Family Guy. And I did play Cleveland on my own show called The Cleveland Show. I also play Herbert, the old man. And I play this guy. Oh, no. He can hardly do Herbert's voice because he's got a little chilly cold. And a few others. I'm here at uh, TEDx RVA because Andy Stefanovich made me come do it. And uh, actually, since I've gotten here, it's totally cool. I'm Kevin Carroll, author, speaker, social change agent from Portland, Oregon, via Philly, PA. I'm here at the TEDx RVA event, excited to participate and to share a simple proclamation around the role and value of play. My name is Zoe Romano. I was the first woman to run across the United States unsupported. Why TEDx RVA? Uh, first of all, I used to listen to TED Talks while I was running across the country, and it 
enlightened me. I finished the run a much smarter person. And so now I get to be here um, and to talk about the role of vulnerability and uncertainty in achieving something like running across the country. There's a lot going on in Richmond uh, creatively. There has been for years, but I think a lot of it's really emerging and becoming part of the consciousness around here. Um, it's a lot more prominent than it used to be. And hopefully this event here will just spark more. I mean, if you got stuff going on in little pockets, that's all good. But bringing it all together, I think, is, is going to help it kind of blow up around here. I'd love to see more films get done, uh, you know, Hollywood films around here. I'm going to shoot a film here. I think just by getting creative people together, good things happen. Mike Henry, Cleveland Brown. Herbert the Pervert. Bruce the Performance Artist. Nothing to do on swing. I hope to spread this message that whatever dream you have or whatever you think you can do, just begin it. It doesn't necessarily matter what happens next, just begin it. And especially with the Tour de France run that I have coming up, uh, females are not allowed to compete in the Tour de France, so it's kind of especially powerful to me that as a female I'm doing this um, to show what we, we girls, we women can achieve. And so I hope to reach a lot of young girls across the country and worldwide. Um, through TED Talks and through TEDx and, and just with this message that we absolutely all can achieve the extraordinary. We just have to be willing to go for it and to begin it. So I'm here to tell you this, that you need to raise your game as it relates to creativity. We all speak ball. You need to make sure that you're paying attention to play, never marginalize it, always celebrating it. So here we are, TEDx RVA. I'm Kevin Carroll, Positive Deviant, agent for social change, author and speaker. Peace and play. RVA Grooves will be right back. standing on the corner of Lombardi and Lee, right in front of Sugar Shack Donuts. I'm gonna go inside and talk to the owner about his amazing donut experience. They've only been open 30 days and it's already created this great buzz in Richmond. Let's go inside and check out Sugar Shack Donuts. Now I'm inside talking to owner and visionary Ian Kelly about Sugar Shack Donuts. Ian, how did you get this concept started? Um, I was living out in Seattle and I was going to donut shops and coffee shops on my day off and I started thinking about what Richmond really needed and this was the first thing that came to my mind. I you know, sitting in Top Hot Donuts one day and I thought, we need gourmet, we need something new and fresh and exciting here in Richmond. And, Brought it back a couple years ago, started writing up concepts, and here we are today. And you picked a great location. If you know this area, I know this used to be a used car lot. It was. So how yeah. did you decide to put your, your, your donut shop here? Well, I actually coach soccer across the street. I've been there for about four years. Um, every single day I would leave soccer practice, and you know I'd see this building, and one day I went back to practice, and I told my girls, I said, I'm going to open a, a shop there. I'm going to open a donut shop there. And they all laughed and didn't believe me. And, Two years later, I finally made it happen, and now they love it. They come over every single day. But this location is as perfect as it could be. Yeah, I mean, not just having Maggie Walker, Virginia right. Union, and VCU. The last 30 days since you've been open have been extremely busy. Oh, Did it's you expect that? not at all. Not at all. We thought that this was going to be a casual come in, a couple people in the morning, get some coffee and donuts and leave. And, you know, we offer our staff about 12 people since we opened. We've had a line out the door every single day. On Sundays, we sell out. Saturday mornings, it's 50 people deep. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Now, 
the donuts look amazing, and I'm it, Thank you. I'm, I'm ready to eat mine. <laughs> Good. But uh, talk about the different flavors and how did you choose which ones would come into the shop? Um, well, a lot of them are basics. I mean, a lot of the things that we brought in are things you can get at other donut shops, but we make our own glazes, we make all of our own icings. It was something that I wanted to do to make it a little bit more fresh and appealing than just another donut shop. Um, some of the stuff I brought from my experience in Vail, Colorado, some of it was from Seattle. Um, I spent some time down in Portland checking out Voodoo Donuts, huge inspiration of mine, and I went to Brooklyn and went to Donut Plant and got some ideas from them. Um, so like the Bacon Maple, for example, it's not an original concept, it's something that they do at a lot of other donut shops. The only difference is that uh, we make our own maple glazes, we use a thicker cut bacon, instead of putting a strip that pulls off, we use chopped bacon that we cut ourselves. You it's a completely drooling. different, well, I'm Bacon glad. is my favorite, <laughs> so anyway, I'm sorry. It's everybody's even, favorite, that's our number focus. one seller. Ian, when your customer comes in here, what is the experience that you want them to walk away with? Fun, definitely fun. Uh, when I designed this place, I made it with windows so that you can see the decorating room, a dough table right down the hallway so you can see us doing fresh dough. We try to make it fun for kids when they come in. We put gnomes on the inside of the boxes, fun flavors, bright colors, you know, a lot of stuff that people just light up when they come in here and see the case. Yeah, and I see there's a coffee bar back there, uh, and it seems like it's just as big as the donuts. What's the coffee experience? There is. Um, well, living out in Seattle and spending the time out there, it was a big, big thing that I wanted to bring back to Richmond was something a little bit different with the coffee world. A lot of the places that you go to get fresh donuts, you can't get coffee as well. It's one or the other. Um, so to me it was let's bring back some of that West Coast influence. I brought back a couple of flavored coffees that I really liked from over there that you couldn't get here with fresh fruits and oranges and whatnot in them. Um, a heavy influence on Cuban coffees was something big for me because I'm from Tampa so I wanted to bring that in a little bit. But I wanted it to be to rival Starbucks. I wanted it to be something where people could come in and get a latte or get a cortadito or a cafe con leche and really just enjoy the coffee with a fresh donut. Well, the smell is overwhelming. All I can hear is bacon and maple. <laughs> so, Ian, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Now, I'm standing with Alexis, manager, and we have some delicious goodies in our hands. Tell me what we have. We have um, the bacon maple, which is one of our best sellers. We probably sell more of that than anything else, even our standard glaze. Um, it has the house-made maple um, glaze on it and the thick-cut bacon on top. Um, I have uh, one of my favorites, which is our chocolate iced donut. It has the Belgian chocolate on it, which has a really rich flavor in it, and it's actually different than what we started with, but definitely improved. All right, so just don't mind me for a second because I'm about to eat this, okay? <laughs> oh, I cannot wait. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. I don't know why I wasn't expecting the donut to be so light. It's like very, very light. Yeah. And, and and fluffy and, and the bacon, you can tell it's just it's fresh. It's really, really good. Oh yeah. my God. Now, when your customer comes in and they just seem like, you know, just give me anything, what do you usually suggest for you um, know, a client that wants to take something back to maybe their office or, you know, a family function or something like that? Well, typically I ask if it's going to be like an office or a meeting or something or if it's family. Um, a lot of the kids and family type like the cereal topped and have all the crazy things on them that are really, really fun. Um, I mean, our business card says, um, Donuts, coffee, and high fives. So, you know, yeah. um, if it's a meeting, we try to tone it down a little. We'll do, you know, regular glaze and chocolate for those basic people like myself. Mm -hmm. um, we usually throw in a few of our sta staples like the bacon maple and also um, like our salted caramel is a really good seller, too. Yeah, I'm listening to you, but I'm not. So, <laughs> let's wrap this up so I can dig in some more. Um, give us all of the social information. How do people get in contact with you all? Hours of operation, address. They want some donuts, they need to contact. Contact you also tell them how. Yeah, um, our biggest social media is going to be Facebook, and we are at Sugar Shack Donuts on Facebook. Um, now, our Twitter and Instagram are the same, so it's RVA Donuts. So they can follow us on there as well for some amazing, tempting pictures. Okay, yes. um, our hours are going to be Monday through Friday, 6.30 to 3.30. We are looking to expand that a little bit after the end of the summer when we get some um, these Maggie Walker students coming in after school. Um, Saturdays we're open from 8 to 3.30. And then Sundays we do a gluten-free day. And we also have vegan items and other things available on that day. Um, so we don't have our typical donuts, but it's only from 9 to 12. Uh, we typically have a nice long line, so be prepared, but yeah. definitely um, a good little niche product for the Richmond community. Yeah. Well, definitely have to experience this. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to RVA Grooves. Sure, thank you. RVA Grooves, all things arts and culture. Mm.
of Grid Magazine and how their art and culture movement collaborates with this show. I'm also going to talk to the head chef about the Roosevelt experience. Let's go inside and check them out. Now I'm inside Roosevelt with chef and co-owner Lee Gregory. Thank you for taking the time to talk to RVA Grooves. I know you're really busy and I'm going to let you get back. A couple sure. questions for you. Background, how'd you get started in the business? Um, I went to Clemson and then I ended up going to culinary school and doing an internship at a restaurant, which at the time it was in Carytown, a K-Shop. Oh, yeah. And um, that was 1999. And never really left. Well, I mean, Churchill is definitely a great neighborhood. And like you said, it's starting to get a lot more restaurants down here. Now, you've won an award, well, nominated for the James Beard Award. Yep. Talk about uh, that, that experience and that feeling. Uh, again, one of those things that was completely caught us all by surprise. I never, never saw it coming. I'm not even a member of the James Beard Foundation. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, just a, a real shock and a complete uh, honor, you know, to um, be including some of the names that are out there. I mean, it really is, you know, the cream of the crop, and, you know, the best names in the business that usually get get involved or nominated for something like this. And, you know, nice to be a part of. Great to be mentioned. Yeah. Well, I'm going to move on to, it's almost time for me to eat and drink. I do that very well, chef, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Talk about your cocktail program you have here. Uh, we're really, really lucky to have a guy named Thomas Leggett um, that was on, been on board with us since we opened up. Um, he's probably worked with me or for me in a sense for four or five years, and really we're on the same page. And I think uh, the thing about our cocktails is that they're all balanced. Um, whether, excuse me, whether being bitter, uh, sweet, sour, mm -hmm. alcoholic, or too hot in a yeah. sense is what I always call it. Uh, they're, they're so balanced that you can drink them all very easily. Uh, he plays off of what we do in the kitchen very well. And, uh, you know, his drinks are real seasonal as well. So it all kind of lines up in some sort of able to capture great balance throughout the whole restaurant. Today, we're gonna, I know we're going to do a tomato salad for you with um, it's all, you know, local tomatoes, watermelon, um, local ricotta, uh, olive oil from Georgia, um, and then we'll let you do our pimento cheese that we always have, uh, and maybe chicken wings. We we'll smoke them. Um, they come from a farm in North Carolina. And then we do an Alabama white sauce, is what it's called. It's like a, it's their version of barbecue sauce in Alabama. Um, and then rockfish, uh, it's from the bay. Um, we do a chicken entree as well, and then pork from uh, Waynesboro. Wow. I'm drooling now. I'm ready to eat. Sitting down with Leslie and Paul from Grid Magazine. First of all, thank you guys for taking the time to talk to us. We have some great appetizers and great drinks in front of us. So we're going to talk and we're going to dig in, okay? Uh, my first thing to you all is, how did the magazine come about? How did you guys get it started? 
Uh -huh. Well, I guess I'd start with saying that uh, grid is more than a magazine. Yeah. Uh, we like to call it a, a, a greater rich movie. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, between the two of us, we often say that it's, it's bigger than the printed page. Okay. Greater Richmond Grid was started in the early days by actually the Greater Richmond Partnership. Mm -hmm. And at that time it was called Work Magazine. Work Magazine uh, put together a great publication that uh, was uh, a representation of local businesses, or regional businesses that were doing great things. Yeah. And over the years, Work Magazine moved to Polari Publishing. Polari Publishing spun off several sister publications. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, Urge Magazine that celebrated arts and culture. And it was Sports Backers Quarterly that, that obviously focused on sports and recreation in the area. About five years ago, they decided to bring all of those magazines together under the name of Grid. Mm -hmm. And so Grid represents uh, today, current uh, iteration is uh, Work, Live, and Play. So all of those magazines came together as Grid Magazine, how the region works, lives, and plays. And, uh, that brings us up to the point that, that Leslie and I got involved. And, and if you think of grid, like an urban development, cities are planned on a grid. Okay. And it's where things connect. It's the intersection. And so that's what we like to do. We like to think of creating this serendipitous connection, intersection, for where Richmonders in the region work, live, yeah. and play. Yeah. All right, our last course, we are now at dessert, finally, one of my favorites. My favorite, too. Now, as we eat dessert, um, let's talk just a little bit about where Grid Magazine is going, and especially with this art and culture movement, um, you know, you're from Richmond. Did you right. ever expect that it would take this boom, and how is Grid going to transform with the boom that it has? Well, I was always hoping that Richmond would take this boom, and I think we finally have passed that mark, and if you think about it, I mean, just as short as five years ago, you were really challenged to find a lot of different new restaurants that you could go out and try. I have friends that are challenging each other to go to a different restaurant every night for 30 days, mm. and you can do that yes, in the gym now. There are lots of choices, um, lots of variety, and it's just great. We're yeah. booming. And it's, again, it's all about the movement, and that's the future for Grid Magazine. We feel like we've been some of the leaders in that movement and we want to continue in that role. And I think in the future you're going to see more um, crossover between all the great art and culture that Richmond has to offer from, you know, going to the museum or going to the Richmond Ballet or the Symphony or First Fridays yeah. to the gallery and then coming to Church Hill or or going anywhere to try a new restaurant, something that you haven't done before. Well, I hope everyone gets involved. Thank you guys so much Thank for taking the time family. to talk to RBA Groups. This was Thank wonderful. You. We're going to dig into dessert. Thanks for watching, and tune in next week. RBA Groups, all things arts and culture.